Stevie, before you get jump back into your story, I just wanted to reflect on what you shared about people wanting you to post that BLM uh, insignia on your Instagram post. It's all part of the whole virtue signaling, which really bothers me because I don't believe virtue can be signaled. Virtue is lived. Mm. And, and that's a really dangerous thing when people think that they've actually been virtuous by performative acts. So um, the virtue in all of this was what you did, taking a stand for what you believed in and, and doing it with integrity, courage, and quite frankly, respectfully uh, and with dignity. So go on and uh, please, please pick up where we left off. Yeah, you're talking about how this was a really difficult time and you just stood firm through it. So what made it difficult for you? Well, I think the biggest thing for me was at the time I belonged to a fraternity, the only fraternity at Belmont. And these had been my brothers for, you know, over a year I'd been in this fraternity and they were great people. It was, you know, politics did not matter. You know, at the time before July and June and May of 2020, it didn't matter if you were a Republican, if you were a Democrat, if you didn't care about politics, everyone got along. You know, Belmont is a small school of only, I think at the time it was seven or 8,000 students. And so I think the, the hardest part for me was in those weeks following me posting that I was proud to be from this country, I had a few fraternity brothers reach out and at first they said, hey, you should consider saying Black Lives Matter and getting behind the organization because people are you know, starting to talk about it and they think that, they, that you don't understand how America is a racist country. And of course, America is not a racist country and that's what I would tell them. Well, it got worse, much worse, those following weeks when I was referred to the standards board of my fraternity, which is the uh, kind of like the judicial branch. And they usually only refer brothers who have broken the law or have, you know, done things that are not up to the standards, standards of our fraternity. Well, a fellow brother of mine referred me because he called me a racist because I would not endorse the BLM organization. And Tennessee, fortunately, is a single party consent state. It's a beautiful state and very grateful that we left Chicago to come here. So I knew something was wrong. I just had a, a very bad feeling about it. So we scheduled these Zoom meetings and I recorded them with my phone while I was doing the Zoom on my laptop. And in these meetings, these brothers of mine say that if I don't endorse the BLM organization, if I don't apologize and don't take down my post, they were going to do whatever it took to destroy me uh, because I was standing up against the the waves, the torrents of people that were just bowing down to the, the woke mob because they were scared of, of being criticized like I had been at the time. And so unfortunately, my, my big brother of the fraternity who chaired the standards board meeting told me that if I did not do what these students demanded of me and my fraternity that then that they would take action and, and get rid of me from the fraternity. And then of course the fraternity a few days later ended up endorsing the organization. And I left the fraternity out of protest along with two or three friends of mine who were very supportive. So even though it was very difficult, you know, having my brothers turn on me, the students, uh, all of my friends, there were a few of them that, that stuck with me who I still talk to today and they've never, compromise. Now, I'm always very grateful for their support because they made it a lot easier. They made the, the tough days a little easier and they went by a lot quicker because I had people like that supporting me. Hmm. It sounds like bullying behavior. So knowing everything you say, um, you, like you mentioned, the it, it, things were political, but the post that you're talking about wasn't overtly political. I mean, you haven't mentioned anything Republican or Democrat in your post. I know a lot of Democrats who love America and celebrate July 4th. Um, and it's interesting that they were actually like demanding and forcing compelled speech in order to be a member of the fraternity. And then same thing with the university. Um, you don't get to be student body president unless you conform and your compelled speech that's actually surrendering and trampling on your constitutional rights is you know, going right back to Gloria's story, you're putting you right back into Yugoslavia. Uh, so interesting that the things that were being demanded of you um, were anti-American, fundamentally anti-American, but also 
For people who remember that time or remember some other things that have happened recently, the America that we can kind of live in now, one of the reasons this method works is because so many people, as you say, just lay down and submit. When you're faced with that kind of an onslaught of pressure, they would just take the post down or just say, yes, I think the lives of people who are black matter. And so if you want me to put a black square up, now all the pressure goes away. Why didn't you? Well, for a few reasons. One, I would never be told what to do or threatened of what to do and told you must do this or else. It's like you said, on American. And I remember, you know, I was 12, 13, 14 years old. And I remember listening to my grandfather who was mm. born in 1923 in Yugoslavia. So, you know, in the 40s, when he was around my age, he was hiding from Hitler. And in the 50s, he was trying to escape from Tito. And I just remember talking to him of, him saying, the government told you what to say. They published the only mm -hmm. paper. Uh, and I remember him telling me that he knew people that spoke out against the government and they wanted to kill those people. And so when all these people were rushing blindly to support this organization, which has now proven itself uh, to have given the founders very nice homes in LA and around the country, you know, I just, I, I had my suspicions. Uh, but also I think that it was just on their, on their website, it said they were self-avowed trained Marxists and they were an anti-Christian organization. So it would have been easier, absolutely, like you said, to, to take down the post and the, to say, you know, I, enough is enough. I just want to get along with people. But what I realized was no one would remember this years in the future except for me. And I would have to live with the decisions mm -hmm. I made. And my parents would remember the decisions I made and my friends did. So I wanted to make sure that I made myself proud and stood up for what I believed in and wanted to look in the mirrors and have no regrets, you know, 10, 20, 30 years down the line. And fortunately, I can say that I, I think I did everything right. You know, I still, I, if the exact same situation happened, I would not have changed anything except instead of posting that picture on the 4th of July at 8 p.m., I would have done it at 8 a.m. so that those people <laughs> could have been mad and gotten it out of the way earlier rather than in the evening. <laughs> well, let's let's let me just quote what you said, because I don't think we've quoted that for our audience yet. This is what you said, quote, proud to be an American celebrating the sacrifice of those that gave their all so that we may enjoy the freedom and liberties our forefathers intended on this day in 1776. There is really nothing controversial about that. I mean, that is basic American history. And yet you were pilloried, you were attacked and you you stood mm -hmm. your ground. So let me let me pivot, if we can, to, to Gloria um, in this last few minutes we have in this segment. As a mom, I can imagine you were really concerned about the vicious and unhinged responses that Stevie was receiving to his post. My understanding is that you reached out to Belmont University's leadership yourself. What happened when you talked to the university about the situation and what measures, if any, did the university take to, to help Stevie? Well, Belmont is a small university, as Stevie said. So what I did, my husband and I decided we would reach out to the president, who was supposedly always available. And when I called, his assistant told me that um, she knew that there was something going on with Stevie's social media. So they were aware of the situation, but she would have um, the president at that point call me back. And I waited and waited and waited. And of course, I got no phone call from him. But about three days later, I did get a phone call from their lead attorney, who point blank said what? to me, their lead attorney, yes, who point blank said to me, are you going to be suing Belmont University? And I said, what would I be suing for? I said, my phone call is to address the issue of, I mean, we thought COVID was going to be two weeks. So how is my son going to be safe on a college campus when we have students telling him to go kill himself? I mean, all, if you read the comments, they're very threatening. And as a parent, it's very frightening. I mean, you have children. It's very frightening to have these children coming after, these students coming after your son. So my husband and I, we didn't even want Stevie to go back to Belmont, but he was never going to give up. So um, I made it clear to the attorney that my only concern was my son's safety. And he said, someone will be getting back to you on that. No one got back to me on that. So Stevie and I reached out to campus security and we offered to um, 
We did a Zoom call with them as well. And we offered to have private security escort Stevie on campus. And they were not they were not okay with, you know, a private security person carrying a weapon, which I understand. It's a private university. It's fair school. It's fair property. I understand that, and I respect that. And one officer who was on the Zoom call, who is with Belmont University, he offered to escort Stevie from class to class. When he got on campus, he offered to escort him on campus from one class to the next to the next. However, they told us that Stevie's vehicle, his car was not allowed on campus. They could not guarantee its safety. They had no idea what somebody may do to it. And so he would have to figure out a way to get to school. And he was living at home. He was not living on campus. He would have to figure out a way how to get to school. So we did. We figured it out. He parked his car um, at a friend's garage three blocks away. And a friend or I would pick him up, drive him to school, deliver him to campus security. The police officer would escort him all around campus. And, you know, then see, we would go through the same thing to get him back, you know, to his car.